Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, happy Thursday. Uh, it's so nice to see so many people. You can't believe how happy that makes me anyway, as a social animal. Welcome uh, to the October uh, meetup um, for the Architecture Fringe 2021. This is basically the start of the road towards um, the Architecture Fringe. So um, thank you so much for all being here. Um, it's so nice to see so many of you. Um, some of you will have obviously joined us before on the Architecture Fringe programme. Um, if you have, welcome back. It's nice to see you again. Um, if, this, if this is the first time um, you're joining us, um, a warm welcome to you. Um, we've been going since uh, 2016 uh, with a festival every year and uh, we're now in a two-year model. So um, this is kind of the start of our sort of biennial season. Um, but if you're new, a warm welcome to you. Um, the meetups have generally been a key part of how we produce the architecture fringe, to be honest. Uh, normally we are in situ in places, we kind of flip flop between Edinburgh and Glasgow, sometimes we're in Inverness as well. And the meetups are a really nice way for people to meet each other, um, kind of um, explore um, ideas um, and share contacts and uh, just generally build the open programme together. Um, so we're obviously online uh, this time um, and uh, we appreciate you being here. So we're going to try our best to reenact some of the, the warmth and engagement uh, that we normally have um, at the meetups in person. But uh, welcome and thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Andy Summers. I'm a co-founder and co-director of the Architecture Fringe. Um, along with me here um, are my colleagues, uh, Raina Ar Armstrong, Shona Common, uh, Louisa Butler, uh, Matt Limperopoulos and Neil McGuire. And we all have um, AF slash at the start of our names. Um, we're also super excited to be joined for October by Sumita Singer, who's also here. So um, hello, Sumita, how are you doing? Hi, I'm really very happy to be here today. Well, thank you for joining us. We really do appreciate it. Um, so yeah, tonight is going to be um, a bit of provocation from Samita. Um, we're also going to go through um, the unlearning uh, theme, which we have put together for the Architecture Fringe 2021. Um, so a bit of inspiration for everybody. Um, we will have then later on some smaller um, breakout spaces for everybody, because obviously with all of us being here, it's very hard to um, talk together. So we'll break down into smaller spaces together, um, which will be facilitated by the team here. And um, so everyone can chat and go through some ideas and get some help, etc. cetera. Um, and then at the very end, we'll have some social time. Uh, if you'd like to try and hang out with us um, and pretend that we're in person together, but uh, you know, being social is such a, an amazing thing. So if you'd like to be with us till all the way to half eight, you're very welcome um, to join us. It'd be lovely to chat to you. Um, now, uh, what we're going to do um, at the meetups normally, um, we normally do a little uh, few minutes where everyone basically introduces themselves to someone they don't know. And I know we might have all lost our social skills in the past nine months, myself included, um, but we're going to break out into little random spaces just for about three minutes um, each, uh, three minutes overall, and uh, we're just going to introduce ourselves to some other people who are here and have a quick chat and then we'll all come back and reconvene. So I think Raina's going to do that. Okay, um, we're just going to move into a quick introduction to the theme just now. Um, this is really, I suppose, um, just to try and give you a kind of overview of kind of where we've come from to kind of arrive at this theme of un unlearning. Um, and I'm going to sort of keep this very brief because we're, we're slightly running uh, over schedule already anyway. So, um, yeah, it's just to talk a little bit about it. And um, I'll, I'll just kind of, I suppose, just give you a bit of background on, on, on the theme and then and then the provocation really is there for you to kind of take that forward and, and think about what it might mean in relation to your practice or, or your interests or your work. So um, it's rapidly transformed from an observation to a truism to a cliche, but we are, if you didn't already know, living in unprecedented times. Um, the intersection of a global viral pandemic and a climate emergency against a backdrop of extractive and exploitative neoliberal capitalism means the ground on which we're 
standing is moving fast or hopefully moving fast. Change is happening. Um, and in order to make that change positive and transformative, what fundamentals do we need to question and what learning, new learning do we need to undertake? So that gives you a kind of a, a kind of a slight sort of insight into, into where the provocation from came from. And in terms of a kind of a provocation to us, I think it's also important at this point, I suppose, to acknowledge that the phrase on learning or that kind of terminology um, came to our attention predominantly, I think, through the kind of Black Lives Matter protests that happened uh, earlier on in the year as well. And I think to kind of acknowledge that um, is important and also to say that I suppose it taps in for us uh, into that idea that um, uh, it is it's possible to kind of question and to analyze and think about and maybe try and dismantle as well some of the underlying orthodoxies that kind of dictate how we work, how um, we think about space and place and people's place within that as well. So um, that sort of, I suppose, describes a little bit about the background um, uh, to, to where we've kind of come from. We're really delighted to have um, Smita with us this evening and she's gonna talk. We're gonna try at these meetups to try and um, invite a guest um, to offer their particular take on this topic or, or, or a reflection. Um, as to how it might relate to their work or their interests. And um, really looking forward to hearing that talk uh, in just a moment. So I was just gonna end with a, with a quote um, from the Brazilian um, scholar and academic Paulo Freire. Um, and it says, it's imperative that we maintain hope even when the harshness of reality may suggest the opposite. So in many ways, this year's provocation is about breaking down, but also about building up again and building back um, and thinking about how we kind of reconstruct uh, the ways in which we, we operate and work. And I think Architecture Fringe, we hope anyway, provides people with a sort of playground to test out and experiment with ideas, um, take, take, uh, take forward projects that might, find, might be difficult to kind of pursue in other environments and kind of give them a public as well and try and engage with the public uh, uh, about architecture's role uh, in, in the public realm and in public life more generally. So uh, I'll just finish there and I don't want to kind of go on too long about it, but um, as they were really interested to hear what people's um, responses are to the theme and uh, hopefully in the breakout sessions later on, it's a chance for you all to ex to uh, articulate maybe some of your ideas and thoughts and hear about what other people uh, are interested in, in, in looking into as well. Um, we're really keen those breakouts become a point where you can kind of make contact as well with people who are maybe pursuing similar issues or have similar interests and maybe some kind of collaborations can kind of come out of that as well. So um, there's additional information about the theme on, on the Architecture Fringe website, architecturefringe.com, if you want to find out more. And as I say, hopefully these discussions will evolve as the meetups uh, continue. So I'm going to hand you over to Shona now, who's going to in, introduce uh, tonight's speaker. Thank you. Uh, so we're delighted to have Smita Singha joining us this evening to deliver the first short provocation in reference to the Architecture Fringe 2021 theme of unlearning. Tonight, she will be delivering a short presentation with the title Climate, Colonialism and Context. There will be an opportunity for five to 10 minutes of questions at the end of Samita's presentation. So send them in to chat and um, send them to everybody so that we can all see them. There might be like some uh, common questions there. It might be about your reflections from what she's saying or just a question for herself. Um, and we would invite you to ask the question at the end. So I'll just pick out some from, from that chat function. Um, Samita is an award-winning architect, academic, author, with her own design practice, Ecologic, which has worked internationally. Samita's successful career started early with a UIA UNESCO International Design Award for her thesis, on the back of which she received a Cambridge University Scholarship in Sustainable Design. Her other awards include the Women in Business Award at the House of Commons and Atkins Inspire Award for Architecture. Samita set up Architects for Change, the Equality Forum at the Royal Institute of British Architects, and is past chair of Women in Architecture. She was elected to the RIBA Council, and served on many RIBA committees over the past 25 years. And this year, as I'm sure many of you know, she ran an election for president of the Institute. Samita has taught architecture in the UK and abroad. Presently, she is a tutor in professional practice at the University of Westminster. She is the founding director of Chara Shilla, an international design charity for community projects. And she is the author of many books, including Architecture for Rapid Change and Scarce Resources, Autotelic Architect and Women in Architecture. Um, so 
just a reminder, send your questions into the chat. Um, can I also remind you just to remain muted? I'm sure you all know this by now. Um, and without further ado, I'll hand over to Samita, if someone can share her slides. Thanks very much, Anna, for the introduction. Um, yeah, so you, you know about me, I'm not going to say any more, but I also have a, a connection with health that I'm a non-exec director at um, in, in an NHS trust. So uh, <clears throat> I will be bringing that into the presentation uh, as well. So I'm, I'm very, very pleased to be here because Scotland is uh, one of my favorite places in the planet. When I got married, I brought my husband to Scotland for a honeymoon <laughs> and we traveled around Scotland because I was so um, happy to be there. And I, any, any chance to come to Scotland, I you know, take it. Um, so today's talk is about climate, colonialism and context. And um, you know, we have the situation where the climate crisis, inequality and disruptive changes to the profession, COVID-19, everything's going on. It seems that, you know, I think someone said, you know, the, the floor was sort of shaking, moving the world's um, upside down. So we as a profession, we are in a state of flux. And um, we as architects, I'm sure all of you know, there, there are several ways of, of dealing with this. We know about, uh, and they all start with R. So it's about reusing, retrofit, reducing, recovery, recycling, and repurposing. So all the R's we, we know about, and especially with your um, background in, in, in Archifringe, you, you would know all that. So I'm not here to talk about that. Um, and also Scotland is, is further in its intention than many other um, nations and including those in the UK. So we, you've had your zero waste policy from 2010, so it's 10 years old now. And you also set an ambitious target to become net zero by 2045 with 75% reduction in your greenhouse gases by 2030. So I think that's, that's really, really encouraging as well. So I'm not going to talk to the, you know, converted about all those sort of issues. Um, today, I want to bring a perspective, a global perspective and a perspective from where I come from, which is India, uh, and talk to you about that as a provocation to see how you as architects, how you as citizens can actually do something about it. Um, so I want to propose that um, that uh, from colonized nations and uh, those who uh, they, they have uh, issues still arising from being colonized. I want to propose that climate crisis, sustainable development and colonization have a linked history, hence the title of my presentation. Um, so also you'll see hopefully the provocation will lead you on to group discussions where you can see there could be multiple uh, ways of dealing with the situation uh, and uh, the problems and solutions might be perceived differently uh, by different people. Um, and unfortunately, build, the building industry continues to have um, a, a link with the climate crisis, as you all know, and with colonial practices from a long time back. So um, I'm going to start with the first slide, please. Okay. So the first slide, uh, the slide here is about disconnection, and and you know this, the fact that where things are being produced is so disconnected from the user, and this is a result of not having a circular economy, but having a linear economy. And the problem with a linear economy is that it's not, not a natural way of doing things. So in nature, things are, things are produced and they actually uh, go back as, as fertilizer or um, into the air or water and they do something else which feed back. And so there's a circular uh, way of that nature functions which doesn't happen with our linear way of producing things which started from um, the Industrial Revolution. Now, there are two aspects as well to this. The first is that the waste produced, it's not very easy to um, deal with the waste uh, produced with the 
linear economy because you are so disconnected, you actually don't see the waste. So the construction industry is the UK's biggest uh, consumer of natural resources. So 400 million tons of material each year um, results in 100 million uh, tons of waste being produced. So it's one fourth of the, the amount actually goes into landfill or is unusable. Um, and so that, that's not a linear economy. You have a situation where you know, you're actually extracting something from the land and that's ending up becoming waste. The other thing the linear system does is obviously this disconnection between the land and the user. So you don't see what happens. So a lot of the waste that we produce um, from construction, from different places, even medical waste ends up in places like Turkey and Vietnam, Malaysia, Taiwan, and we, we don't see that. It's just, you know, you put it in the recycling bin and off it goes. You don't know where it, where it, what's happening to it. And I think there was one point where um, there was some investigation and they found medical waste uh, from the UK uh, lying in, in Turkey. So this kind of disconnection has to stop in, in order for us to um, be able to uh, design sustainably. Uh, next slide, please. So there, with, with colonization, you actually see, um, or you grew up with a narrative or a history that um, you're pr probably not familiar with. So there are things that we saw in the colonies that you didn't see, and there are things I come here and see. So the first um, slide, the first picture is uh, the VE Day celebrations in 1945. And uh, those were being shown in all these uh, various channels um, uh, some time back uh, when we were celebrating VE Day uh, recently. And, but what is not being shown is that uh, more than 3 million Bengalis died in the Bengal famine. And that is the picture. That's one of the really sad pictures of bodies lying in the street being eaten by vultures. And I'm sorry, I'm having to show this because this is a picture that you don't see because food was taken away from Bengal in order to feed the armies that were fighting. And this only happened in Bengal, it didn't happen in the neighboring part of Burma, for example, because, or it's called Myanmar now, but it didn't happen there because the food distribution was different um, there. But it was taken from these people in order to feed the people that were fighting the war. Then um, Bengal was one state that was partitioned twice. Um, so first it was partitioned, then it was united, and then it was partitioned again. And the final partition in 1947 meant that 10 million Indians were displaced and one bit of it eventually became Bangladesh um, and the other bit became Pakistan. And then more than a million Indians died during the final partition in 1947. Um, so th these are things that we don't consider and we don't see how it is related to the construction industry. But if you want to, um, you know, if you want to have a global overview, if you want to see the historical narrative that is being produced for you, you need to go beyond what you're actually seeing. You need to see the unseen. Next slide, please. So what you see is what we call development. So this is in London. Um, on, on the screen, you'll see it on the left, which is the Nine Elms development with all the concrete and lovely buildings coming up for housing. And what you don't see is what you see on the right of the screen which is um, which is taken from my village. So you have this lovely sand where I used to play as a child. That's all gone. It's all gone. You can see how much sand has been taken from the entire length of the river. And people have this broken bamboo bridge. They don't even have a bridge to cross the river anymore. And this, this photo was taken, I took it last year um, during the monsoons. Next, please. So um, on the left, you see um, the sort of stuff that is being proposed for CPD by the RIBA. 
So you, you have glass cladding being proposed and it looks really nice maybe. And um, then on the other hand, what you don't see is the air conditioning that's needed for these glazed buildings. Next slide, please. So often inequality is actually visible from the air. And this is a city I worked in quite a bit. This is Caracas. And you can see the motorway and how it actually neatly divides the, the slum areas, the barriers from the so-called middle-class areas with all these concrete skyscrapers. And uh, people who are on the motorway, they don't actually interact. The motorway actually separates um, the two parts of the city. And, and this is, again, a policy from uh, the colonial times where, the, where Caracas was designed as a, uh, from the principles of design of Paris. And this city grew and grew. And then these people came in to work in the city and they had nowhere to live. So they lived on these little hillocks next to the city. And um, these slums actually have more people living in them than the houses uh, facing them. And I wrote about inequality in my book, Architects for Rapid Change and Scarce Resources, which is a subject I was teaching at one point. And, um, you know, you're welcome to read more, but this is a subject I've explored a lot. Next, please. So one way of removing inequality is to have common goals. And the, these were the sustainable development goals um, produced by the United Nations. And they were also produced in 2010. And there are 17 of these. So um, the, the, you can see that some of them perhaps on um, reading that doesn't relate to architecture. So for example, one, um, two, maybe hunger, they have no connection with architecture. But um, my provocation is that they do have a connection with architecture and design. Is how we design cities. Um, are we providing good health? Are we providing areas where people can grow stuff? Are we, um, you know, designing areas so that everyone lives in, in clean and pollution-free environment? Um, and so I was a bit disappointed that uh, the RIBA Sustainable Outcomes Guide, which was produced in 2019, uh, does not include eight of these 17 goals. So they've um, taken out one, two, four, five. Uh, I don't know how they took out gender equality, but they did. Um, and they taken out 10 and uh, 14, 16 and 17. And, and I think partnership, working and engagement with people is so important. Um, and it, again, 16 piece is so important for building cities that I, again, you know, a lot of this is all related. And one of the issues with, um, one of the things I do with healthcare is to try and relate sustainable development goals with the World Health Organization's constitution. Um, so they've, um, the World Health Organization says that it's the state's duty to provide, the, provide for the underlying determinants of health, such as clean water, sanitation, food, housing, and health-related information, education, and gender equality. So it, healthcare is not just about provision of hospitals, equipment, medical medicine, medical staff, but it's linked to the design of cities. So in some ways, what I'm saying, another provocation is that all architects are actually designing healthcare into whatever they design. Whenever you're thinking about sustainable um, living, sustainable design, you're also thinking about healthy cities. Um, next, please. So I'll present now a series of maps that I've been looking at, and I'm not at the end of it. This is sort of the beginning of it. So if you look at colonization map, which is on your left, of the screen. So this is how the world was in 1945 during the VE Day celebration. So a lot of the countries were still under um, UK rule. I think at one point the UK had two thirds of the globe that was under its um, um, control one way or the other. So um, you can see the other countries, probably France maybe next uh, big, 
um, uh, you know, another country that has big, big um, uh, colon, colon, colonies, and then others like Portugal, Netherlands, etc. But there, um, and then you go to the other map, which is the GDP, which is from 2014. You see that in in 70 years, that the countries generally where um, independence was achieved uh, in in that time in that period in the 1940s, um, they all not done so well in terms of their economic growth. But obviously, economic growth isn't the be all of everything. But in terms of per capita wealth, they haven't done well. You look at the whole of Africa which is um, you know, on, in the light blue zone, you look at places like India, et cetera, places like Canada and the United States, uh, the Gulf countries and European countries have done well. Again, you see the Southern European countries haven't done too well and Russia is um, sort of there, halfway there as well. So um, you, you begin to think, did that have an effect on the development of these places? Next slide, please. So if you look at the sustainable development goals and the climate crisis, again, you see this is the dashboard as of last year, 2019. So again, you see a pattern where a large part of Africa hasn't reached the goals. And then you have the richer countries which are almost there. So you can see Norway here. I don't know if I can, um, am I sharing my screen? No, maybe not, but... Um, you can see you know, where we are. And even surprisingly, the United Kingdom with its in inequal um, amounts of um, development around the country, this is still not reaching the um, goals of the sustainable development. And um, the other thing you don't see on the map is obviously within countries. So you have places like Brazil and Australia, which have internal in inequalities. So you've got um, people um, who are facing problems, especially the indigenous uh, populations that are being affected um, through lack of health care, through the fact that recently there's been forest fires in both countries, uh, through COVID at the moment. And, and this is where we need to think very carefully, you know, what, where's our wood coming from? What are we doing? And if you look at the climate crisis, again, you see that um, the, there's been temperature changes in almost everywhere. Um, and, you know, the rich countries and the poor countries, but the uh, looking at the dashboard of the sustainable development goals, we see that the rich countries have managed to um, recover faster or actually benefiting uh, from economic growth. Next, please. So, and, and this slide I've called imposition. I don't know if you've seen this picture, which went viral a couple of days ago. It shows a Komodo dragon facing off a, a truck. And this truck is bringing in reinforcement and they want to build a Disney style, I think it was called a Jurassic, a Jurassic Park in this space, which has been cleared up and um, which used to be full of trees. So, um, what we are seeing here is um, uh, of values, imposition of Western values, which is um, we got cultural, architectural, intellectual values. So uh, I was watching this um, um, class, which uh, which was um, um, this this university, which was looking at um, what were they looking at? Oh, how Western narrative. Uh, and, and they were looking at looking to explore non Eurocentric narratives in the study of architecture, but they used European examples and the canon to explain the context. So again, all our values, architectural, as well as intellectual values are coming from the West. When even when we go because this this uh, this group had gone to Africa to a particular country to look at the systems of architecture and systems of um, designing places, but they'd come back and were connecting Western values with what was happening in Africa. 
then order is, is uh, reinforced by having conditional aid, selective import and exports, we clearing off forests to uh, produce um, things like um, avocados and quinoa, which are very destructive to the landscape and to the ecology of the place, because we think these are healthy stuff to have and we want to have them here. Conditional aid is like, okay, you do this for me and I'll do this for you kind of thing, which actually doesn't help. We want to actually hear what kind of development we need. And then we have the historical stuff, which I've talked about, which is about invasion, colonization and slavery. And then there is the nimbyism, which again, I talked about, which is dumping of waste, offsetting of carbon. So Norway does that, you know, it's got its electric cars, but how is it producing all this electricity? And how is it offsetting um, its electricity um, production with what it's doing, uh, you know, but offsetting it by saying, well, we're doing this in other countries and we are actually uh, transporting stuff to this. So it's, it's all about sort of this kind of nimbyism in uh, construction and energy use. And then you have the exploitation, continuing exploitation of natural and human resources. Um, so for the example, the Arctic is melting, but the countries are more worried about the extraction of minerals and rare metals that are coming up now. Uh, and we need them, obviously we need them for our mobile phones. So these, these four uh, five things, if you can look at that in your provocation and discuss them more, how, how can we as architects actually um, look at this and maybe do things differently? You cannot change history, obviously, but what do you do with this perspective? Do you think architects have a role to play in this? Or you think this is like the RIBA has concluded that some of the SDGs have nothing to do with architecture? So um, I'll, end, I'll end here, happy to take questions now. Um, if people can send through some questions into the chat, that'd be great. Uh, I, for, I think in the first instance, Samita, I wonder if you could elaborate maybe on how, what actions individual citizens could take. Okay, so um, what what I was um, what we can do is actually we can educate ourselves. So the things we don't know about, we need to know about those and look at it more deeply, and actually look at where everything is being produced. So, for example, with plywood production, a lot of the um, plywood comes from China but the plywood is actually being manufactured in China. It's not, so the wood is coming from elsewhere into China and put together as plywood and then being exported to European countries. So have a look at where the wood is coming from. That requires a more deep thinking. And if we're not thinking deeply about these issues, we are going to come up, come up against a barriers about um, you know, how we can actually change the situation. So educate yourself, look more deeply and talk to other people, you know, talk to people uh, from other places. You know, the internet is great. You can do searches, you can actually have connections. So recently I made a connection with somebody from the US and uh, while uh, CLT is being touted as a great thing, he actually gave me a different perspective on CLT and how it's manufactured and where the wood comes from. So I now have a different view. I have more knowledge about CLT, so I might not be using it for everything. I might use it for some things, but not everything. So those three things can be done quite easily. Um, I have a question from Andrew Campbell. I don't know if you want to ask it yourself, if you want to unmute. Just a very basic question, but <laughs> how do we preach to the unconverted? Um, yeah, I, I, that's a great question. You know, how do we preach to the unconverted or to the people who are not part of unlearning or unfringing or whatever? <laughs> so um, I think we, I think you have a very strong voice and particularly, you know, the younger people have a very strong voice. So I think we need to use that voice 
and say, hang on, we need to do the things differently. And that's why this uh, presentation from the School of Architecture actually was very disappointing. The fact that they'd gone to Africa, um, actually seen what was happening and they were coming back and discussing this uh, in, in a, as if they'd never been to Africa. So um, I think we need, we need to talk more. We need to have dialogue and discussion about it. So that's how we preach. Um, I think I can read this. Um, uh -huh. Sunita, do you want to ask the question yourself? Uh, hello, hello. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Always I learn many things from you. So um, in terms of decolonization, I think uh, the transnational solidarity, which means the mutual uh, support from different country uh, that that can be helpful. So, so in this context, diversifying education and recognizing others' work is uh, very much important. And uh, I, so I think how we can we can proceed in this direction. Absolutely, uh, I think it's a shame that you know. We're now 2020 and we've got a system of education that's based on 1950s. And in fact, you know, the RIB is called uh, British, um, British Architects, you know, it's got that in it. And actually we're far more international. The RIB has got like um, architects from 115 countries and we don't acknowledge that. We don't actually have, we have a great diversity of uh, membership and we don't learn from each other. So um, one of the things I said during my campaign was to have a digital platform where we're actually communicating and learning from each other. And I, I think we, we need to have that diversity in um, learning and, um, in, in, and, and that's gonna also help with creativity because the more diverse yes. we are, we're more uh, creative as well. So an and architectural education definitely has to change. Thank you. So, uh, I just wanted to add to what uh, Smita you just said. So I came from India and I found it very difficult. You know, I had to register for part one, part two, part three to be called an architect. And when I spoke to my head of the department in back in India, that why don't you have an affiliation with Reba? And why don't you have a recognition? This was his plain and simple answer. I say, he, they said that why do we need RIBA? To recognize us because they don't even have a you know they're the british architects yeah. so the name itself isolates us mm -hmm. so we will never approach so and, and we when come here we have to struggle for recognition so even if even if i want to appear for say two exams or three exam in a row that is not possible i need to appear for part one part two and part three so there are there are many many uh, inclusion issues and seriously i don't feel part of it because i'm not a member and and most of the time i also found it very funny because riba is running events and in which architects are telling architects how to do architecture and why would you charge your own members a ticket for that event when they have already paid you membership fees and on the other side it, it is just a zoom one hour chat, a presentation. So architects teaching architects and they're paying for it. It's absolutely, I don't understand. It doesn't make sense to me. So how, we, when, why will we not change and when will we change? So even if your very important message, it has come through architecture French and that is, that is one such a nice voice. I've been following it for the last four or five years now. This is such an open platform where you could actually come and talk about it and receive. So thank you very much, Architecture French. Thank you. Thank you. I, I don't know who you are, but thank you very much for your... No, no. no. <laughs> uh, my name is Akash. Oh, so, oh, sorry. My camera is off. Sorry. Yeah. I'm Akash. <laughs> sorry. I didn't thank realize. You. Thank yeah. you for that. Um, yeah, so I, I think uh, when I came from India, the School of Architecture was actually RIBA validated. But um, so that's why I did my part one and part two in India and then came here and I could do my part three here. 
but unfortunately, um, no school in India is affiliated with the RIB anymore. And I, I think people want to do their own thing. And unless the syllabus is changed, which actually appeals to all these 115 countries or countries become like a federation, they have their own rules. This, this is not going to change. But I, anyway, I'm not here to discuss our yes, IBA no, policy. That's fine. So, that's fine. <laughs> uh, but this is my personal feeling. So this is a personal opinion. So please um, don't quote me on it. No, no. Okay. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to uh, interject and we'll, uh, there'll be opportunity at the end with a social if we want to discuss some of the things that have come up because there's some really interesting questions going on in the chat. Um, but I think we need to move now to the breakout rooms where we can also discuss our ideas for, for the Fringe together. Um, so I think I'm going to pass over to Reina and Matt. But thank you again, Smita. It was really, really great talk. Um, and I think it's inspired everyone that's been here with us tonight. So thanks. Um, we'll hopefully catch up and in a more social sense at the end. But I know a lot of you are here to talk about your events and get some feedback and ideas. And so I think most of you may have, or some of you may have selected, been asked at least when you registered for what you want to speak about and you've selected something. I've tried to follow that and I've assigned specific breakout rooms based on the topics you had an interest in, but you feel free to move around. You should be able to, I think I fixed that. So um, yeah, I'm going to start them just now. And uh, there should be at least one fringe member in there to take questions, but basically feel free to chat with each other and hash ideas. Um, yeah, we're obviously getting used to um, being online. So I do apologize if that was a very, very short, um, shared collective space. We do apologize for that. We had a really great chat earlier, but um, we could have done with at least double the time. So um, we do apologize if that was a little short. We're just getting used to being online. But we did have lots to say, which was amazing. And uh, we just thought the team would just very quickly just summarize maybe um, some of the thoughts in each of the rooms so everyone can hear about maybe what was going on, if that's still OK. Um, Neil, would you like to go first? Um, not really, but I will. Uh, and <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we had a really nice chat. There, there were people coming um, with, I guess, some people had questions, other people had kind of potential project ideas. Um, what was nice was that some people were maybe coming with spaces that they had or, or worked with. Um, other people were maybe coming with um, kind of kind of project ideas. Um, uh, in terms of specific kind of project ideas, there was um, one around the idea of trying to make visible the unseen. And I think this connects maybe to a, a question that Morag had put in the question uh, chat before. Um, so around a, a lot of sometimes, I guess, these, these issues are to do with things that are unseen and how as architects, could we help uh, make visible um, things that are maybe maybe not completely invisible, but just are not misunderstood or, 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 or not seen. And I apologize to Andy Campbell for possibly misrepresenting his idea, but it was illustrated with a, a pirated David Shrigley drawing and uh, look forward to seeing that diagram again, a sort of mashup of David Shrigley, Vitruvian man and La Modula as well. So if you can imagine that, you can just all imagine that in your minds. That's me over and out, thank you. Thank you. Louisa, would you like to um, let us know how you got on? Yeah, we um, kind of have a bit focused um, discussion about different projects. And um, we had Evie talking about how she um, and a couple of other people in different rooms had been in touch with community gardens in Glasgow about potentially um, erecting some kind of temporary outdoor structure um, in these gardens. So sounds like something an idea that the fringe definitely keeps coming back to. Uh, so maybe it's time to figure that one out. But, um, and then we had uh, just, I mean, introductions from people wanting to get involved. Um, Ninian Stewart, who was, um, has a really interesting um, project called A Thousand Huts. And I'm not really sure if I fully understand it, but it seems like you're um, kind of building little huts around Scotland or getting them. So that fits in quite well with uh, Evie's project. So, I mean, there's just a bunch of connections we could kind of um, get going and people have started to chat as well and know each other's faces. So that's good. 
Yeah, Thousand Huts campaign has uh, been going for a few years, I think, from my own memory. It's a really wonderful push for um, us to be out in the landscape of work. Um, Shona, would you like to let us know how your group got on? Uh, yeah, so we were having a bit more of a general chat and um, just with some introduction things. Um, so we had a couple of people, well, Miranda Webster and Nick Walker, um, uh, lecturing at GSE and just discussions about how the architecture fringe is great for opening it up to a broad range of people from different backgrounds and that opening up those discussions. Um, we have had a Christina from ISM um, who launched their event, launched their publication last year with uh, Archie French and we'll be looking to do similar sort of launches with us um, and discussions about how we manage to do things within the digital world, not just the physical. And I guess we've really got challenges there um, and there'll be discussions that we can have together and uh, share ideas there. Um, we had a couple from Sustrans um, looking to make collaborations with other people, uh, thinking about placemaking in Scotland. And I think Nick Walker was actually keen to engage with them. So that was quite a good connection we had. Um, we did also have Morag Bean, um, who uh, Neil had picked up on there and uh, she was really inspired by the talk that we had um, this evening um, and just thinking how we unlearn through uh, showing the unseen. Um, and another just point that was raised at the end there, and I don't know if this is something that we can maybe discuss with the Archifringe generally, but we were brought, uh, Padlet was brought to our attention, which is a way that we might be able to share collectively with everyone here, not just within the architecture fringe, ideas and um, thoughts. Um, so yeah, I think we'll have a wee look into that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> Matt, would you like to share? Uh, hi all. Uh, I guess in our group we had a brief discussion on some ideas for some projects, some uh, people uh, had a more clear idea of what they want to do. Other they just wanted to discuss or listen to uh, what we can do. Uh, mostly our group uh, um, wanted to have an idea of how they could collaborate either with each other or with other people through through the friends. Um, some projects that uh, came up were, uh, for example, Dave uh, Loder, who is a uh, lecturer in GSA. Uh, he had an interesting idea of um, um, basically revealing spaces like infrastructure spaces around the city and something that could happen with uh, undergraduate students and probably postgraduate if I got it right. Um, Ali Sar, who is from ISM, uh, like Sona uh, mentioned before for the ISM, which uh, was part of the architecture things last year. And Alishar also uh, mentioned about things that happened uh, through the ASM and um, how for their new issue they would like to see the potential of new collaborators. Uh, and uh, based on their uh, concept of identity and rethinking identity. Um, uh, Nikki Imri, um, uh, she also had a, a, an interesting idea of uh, community mapping, involving communities and community mapping, which also found quite interesting and something that uh, everyone could relate in a way. Um, Adam from Inverness is uh, uh, ex excited for, for what we're doing and also someone who's uh, looking for uh, of being a collaborator of things, so he would like to know more about us and what we can provide, basically. So, uh, more or less, that's that for me. That was a lot, man. You have like half an hour. That sounds great. <laughs> a lot of time there. Well done. Um, and uh, in my group, we had a really good chat. Everyone was very inspired by the the talk. Um, Sarah uh, from the City of Play was sharing. Um, an idea, a project idea for um, adaptive adaptive skills for, for children in terms of making. Um, it's the Meta Makers Innovation Lab uh, draft name. Um, so um, the City of Play there, we're looking for some collaborators um, to uh, facilitate that. City of Play have put quite a few things on the Architecture Fringe Open Programme before, um, that aimed at children's skill levels, which is great. 
um, Karina and Danica were trying to explore um, perhaps a circular economy for waste materials um, through a digital platform, um, but they are thinking perhaps about prototyping that um, in one of the meanwhile spaces by the high street to um, perhaps uh, test logistics for using the waste materials for construction um, of um, some shelters and things or basically for use from the community. Um, Alexandra from Sustrans was talking about transport inequality um, and how um, more voices can come into conversations and uh, Luke touched on GDP um, as a barometer which needs to perhaps be challenged for um, why, why we're using GDP um, I know the Scottish government is trying to move towards well-being as a, as a barometer for how we're all Doing, which is much better overall than uh, GDP. So that was quite an interesting insight for unlearning how we um, benchmark things essentially. Um, and COP26 was, was mentioned, which was supposed to be uh, this year, but is now next year, which will be in Glasgow. Yes, it is next year. Yes. So it's really interesting. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Um, so as suggested, I, so I said, we, we do realize that was quite short, um, but we do appreciate everyone sharing ideas. Um, one of the best things about the Fringe is it gives you an excuse to talk to absolutely anybody. So please feel free just to get in touch with every, anybody. I'm sure any, everybody's cool with that if you'd like to pick up with them. Um, we'll be, we're here for the next five months um, in November, January, February and March. So there's time to come back and we do this all again. But um, this is our first test run. And um, we've also got a little survey that we'll share. I, I've noticed a couple of people have had to leave so we'll probably just send it out through Eventbrite um, just to ask what your project is and and then as Shona brought up I think Padlet will look into basically some some tool where we can post these up and so you can maybe try and interact and find a project that you find interesting and maybe you want to collaborate on or just bounce ideas off of each other. Yes, I mean, since we started in um, developing the Fringe 2050, we've been hyper aware trying to have some form of collaborative platform where you don't need us basically to meet other collaborators. So we, um, we're obviously still all volunteers here um, and looking for some structural funding still, but we'll try our best to try and set something up where um, you can basically um, signpost that you're looking for some help or a venue or a collaborator. Um, or a funding stream um, and uh, we'll try and help you as best as we can. Um, so, I mean, um, yes, does anybody have any thoughts or reflections? Please just feel free to, to say it. Um, I know it's quite a big ask when there's 41 people, but um, if anybody's had anything to say, please feel free to. I'll, I'll jump in as soon as the rest is. I just, just to say it's a great, really That's fantastic sure. uh, um, theme this year, really inspiring. And uh, I just, I suppose from reading the text uh, or, or the, the sort of provocation uh, that's been put out, there's obviously a lot of kind of references there to you mentioned Paolo Frieri and I'm sure there's some Naomi Klein in there and some other, uh, some other people. And just whether would it be an idea to kind of make explicit um, those kind of references to start a spark or inspire other ideas um, to, to kind of come forward. Um, yeah, I don't know, just a, a small point. But maybe, uh, um, just can I get a bit of a reading list together maybe as well? Uh, so that could be, could, be, could be a nice thing. Thank yeah. you for that. Um, Lizzie's just pointed out that Duncan and Blackmore shared in between putting twins to sleep, good Lord. Um, they've got a wee space called Kiosk in Govan Hill and uh, they'd like for it to be used. And so that's just an idea of, a bunch of events or event spaces even that um, we'd like to also share at some point. Again, uh, some sort of online space where you can find this directory of sympathetic venues. I did actually mention that uh, when I was in the group is that um, I don't know if we'll get to Venice next year. It seems to have a big question mark over it, but um, timing wise, um, it's quite similar because it's June. Um, but we will have, if we're physically allowed to go, we will have an event space in Venice for uh, people like yourselves to use, which is just open to everybody as a kind of like almost Scotland House 
um, and the more people that use that uh, in, in the way that they, they want to, the better. Just an open invitation at the moment. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, we, we tried to dovetail with Venice and then we, we went every two years and it was kind of going to work out but then um, it's changed now so yeah we're kind of at the similar time more I guess well we are there all we're there for all the time now so it's it's open when if we do go well, that's really great. Yeah. worldly okay. events we'll be there for the six months um, just to say we would we were talking about you know what if we all still have to be online in, mm. in June, you know, spaces won't be the thing that we're oh, looking at, them, be yeah. the online the online platforms. Yeah. Um, but there's a real opportunity as, as Nick and I were saying about the delivery of our teaching at the moment is all online and we're learning so many new ways of um, engaging with students about resources and references. But, you know, there's there's possibility there to think about how the um, Archifringe could be delivered if necessary online as a, as a digital platform, digital exhibition. How, how many people engaged with the Architecture Foundation's 100 Day Studio? I mean, that was phenomenal, just in terms of the amount of information that was disseminated. Did anyone attend any of those? It was fantastic. Yeah, I, attend, I attended a, a few. They were amazing. It was really yeah. good. Yeah, but again, in terms of just, you know, if, if it's not an actual event, it could be virtual. Um, and of course, that's then all saved and it's all still available online. Yeah, I mean, as, as a strategy for the core programme, anyway, we are working um, on the basis that we will be online yeah. or in outdoor space, We're working backwards from that to interior spaces. It's up to everybody how they do that, of course. But um, yeah. As uh, Miranda's saying, um, we probably might not be in a different situation next summer, who knows, it's hard to say. So um, even if anyone's applying for funding to Create Scotland, for example, it's perhaps a good idea to try and um, future-proof your project with regards to um, demonstrating that it can be online or an outdoor space, as well as um, mm. maybe switching over into a different space, depending on the rules. Um, but that's kind of how we're working our things out at the moment as well, yeah. Okay, um, and just to clarify, if, if people are new who haven't used the Architecture Fringe open platform before, and it's completely free um, to participate and um, place work onto the platform, um, we don't charge you. Um, how you manage and run your own events with regards to charging for tickets is entirely up to you, but to access the platform, it's entirely free. Um, the production team here does not gatekeep or curate your content either. Um, as long as it's safe and as long as it's real, in terms of, we obviously begin to um, publicize projects and events to our audience. So your project must be real um, when the open call closes um, in April um, with a commitment to happening in June. But beyond that, we don't um, um, manage or, or comment on your, on your work. Um, what you do is entirely up to you and all agency remains with you. Um, these open meetups are a lovely way to try and just um, up, up the, quality or the conceptual depth of what we're all doing to test ideas. Um, that's one of the advantages of us being here together. But um, as said, the rules or the um, participation process hasn't changed for the Architecture Fringe if you've uh, joined us before. Um, anything else, anybody else from the team? No, I mean, just I think other than to say uh, thank you everyone for coming um, this evening. It's really nice to see so many faces, um, some uh, people who we've worked with in the past and some new faces as well. So um, yeah, please do sort of tell and invite other people to, to come along to the next meetup. We're going to try and run these on a sort of monthly basis. So yeah, we just wanted to find out tonight a little bit about when suits people best. And then once we, we've sort of got the survey results now, so we can kind of come out with uh, some dates for November uh, and uh, into the future as well. So uh, keep an eye out on the mailing list. Um, if you don't already subscribe to the, um, to the Architecture Fringe mailing list, then if you go to architecturefringe.com, you can uh, sign up for the, for the mail outs and that's the best way of keeping in touch as well as through social media. Um, and yeah, uh, thank you again, everyone, for coming. Thanks to uh, Sumita for a talk tonight and for really sort of kicking things off as well. Uh, and, and it was some really thought thought provoking ideas. Um, I don't know if anyone can hear, but uh, dinner is being prepared behind me, behind this uh, this uh, this sort of gr 
lava lamp gradient, but um, it's, it, that is actually happening. And I think I'm getting pressured to uh, to, to sign up. <laughs> and Andy, that, can so. I just ask quickly, is uh, Sumita's presentation going to be available? Uh, we, we did record it, yes. So we will um, edit this um, because um, yeah, we've recorded since we've been online since half past six, so you don't want to hear okay, any of that. Great. So uh, we will edit it and it will be on our YouTube channel, yes. Thank you. That's all right. And please do subscribe to our YouTube channel if you like. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Yes, thank you all so much. It's honestly been so great to see everybody. Um, stay safe. Um, as Neil said, we'll be back next month um, with another guest speaker. And we'll be showing you the date for that soon. But as, as said, um, please just make contact with anybody. And we will share contact details with you all back through Eventbrite. Um, but yeah, thank you so much and have a lovely evening. Thank <music> you.